Hello, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Javier Scanet, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, session on how to optimize high-risk uh, patient outcomes. We have the pleasure of having with us uh, today Nikos Werner, Dis Westerman, and Vaspa Nolas. And um, I'm just going to share with you the objectives of the session, um, which, of course, has to do, as the title indicates, on how we manage this type of complex patients in our everyday practice. The profile of patients has become much more complex. The, the vascular access in many occasions has to be um, not radial or femoral, but uh, we have to look, like in these patients, subclavian access. We have to guide our procedures for a long time, look at the pulsatility of the pressure in these particular patients. And when we are performing techniques that may cause non-reflow, that may cause uh, um, impairment in front of the coronary arteries, where we have to optimize the vessel that you were seeing this because you have distal disease, etc. you really need to have very good support from a hemodynamic standpoint. Uh, but on top of that, we have many patients with acute coronary syndromes where it is imperative to stabilize the patient to ensure a good outcome. And due to this, the learning objectives that uh, we choose for these sessions was to learn or to share with you the latest best practices on high-risk PCI and particularly from the standpoint of using mechanical circulatory support to learn about the importance of timing in venoarterial ECMO loading and also to review the latest data on how the use of mechanical circulatory support contributes to improve complete revascular to improve revascularization to achieve complete revascularization in patients and particularly compared with other modalities of uh, support like intraortic balloon pump and with that, um, I will hand it now the podium to Nikos Werner, who is going to uh, go with, present, make his presentation on best practice approach on high-risk percutaneous coronary interventions. Thank you, Nikos. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can I have my slides, please? Oh, yeah. I just, so yeah. Okay, so um, I would like to uh, talk today about the best practice approach um, on high-risk PCI um, patients, and uh, these are my potential conflicts of interest. So um, a couple of, uh, or one or two years ago, we sat together with some European experts on uh, protected PCI procedures, and we thought to um, come up with a European best practice paper. Why do we thought this is uh, important and necessary? Um, once it's about um, that there are a lot of um, unsure and uh, unclear um, situation in terms of patient selection, in terms of pre-procedural workup, so every, every hospital is doing it a little bit different. Um, the anticoagulation regimen has been all uh, for, for a long time a matter of debate. Um, of course, the re revascularization strategy is something um, a lot of people discuss, and also the handling in the patient in the, in the cath lab and um, bailout and complication management plays an important role. So see, we sat together and thought this would be very interesting points. And I would like to go with you through these uh, different points today. Um, as you can imagine, this could feel a whole symposium. So we have only t I have only 10 minutes. Um, so I have to. Um, uh, uh, straighten it up a little bit, of course. So let's start with patient selection, because this is something uh, which is, um, on the first uh, view, it's maybe quite easy. Um, so what we have is more normally patient-related criteria. We have age, we have may maybe prior surgery, or in general, um, patients uh, who are surgical turndowns with a lot of comorbidities. I think that's quite clear. Uh, when it comes to coronary anatomy, it becomes even a little bit more difficult uh, when you think because everybody um, has a different perception of what is a complex coronary uh, situation. We talk about multivessel disease, uh, definitely unprotected left main, last remaining vessel, and all other kinds of different situations where we individually think maybe this is a complex um, situation of the coronary arteries and maybe we ca could run into problems. And the third important thing uh, when we talk about patient selection is, of course, the hemodynamic status. And I think it's uh, very well adapted that patients 
with a depressed left ventricular ejection fraction um, and complex uh, um, coronary situation or comorbidities are patients uh, uh, who may benefit from um, a protective PCI procedure. I think we have good data on that from the uh, PROTECT2 study. Um, but there are also other situations concerning the hemodynamic uh, status, for example, um, severe uh, valve disease, um, anticipated prolonged ischemia time, maybe also increased LVEDPs, something which is still under uh, debate. Um, but all in all, I think these three factors um, make the patient selection. And with the PROTECT4 trial, which is now running, um, I think we will get a very soon uh, uh, more detailed information on the optimal patient selection. What is very important, I think, is that according to your hospital guidelines, um, you discuss these high-risk PCI features within a heart team, remote, or within the hospital, and then come up with a um, decision um, where the surgeon, where the interventional cardiologist and the patient is included um, to make an informed con uh, decision process. and. Um, proceed to the protected PCI. That's something what we feel is really important in these high-risk uh, patients. So what about pre-procedural uh, workup? Um, I think this is also very important because if you have the decision and say, well, this is a high-risk patient with high-risk features and I want to go maybe for a protected PCI procedure, you have to, call, of course, um, look at some uh, uh, different aspects. For, uh, for example, you have, to, of course, to exclude any contraindications for impeller, which may be intraventricular thrombus, for example, or mechanical valve, of course, um, or any uh, significant uh, um, uh, aortic stenosis, for example. You have to have a closer look at the femoral access and also at the entry point where you want to do your puncture. Um, you have to think about um, do you want to use uh, two access or do you want to do a single access? Um, and I think what, what, what's important in this pre-procedural workup is that you get a good impression of the iliofemoral access, that you anticipate problems, and that you, uh, in a preview of your case, um, evaluate whether this is a patient suitable for an impeller implantation. And I would look, like to go a little bit more into the pre-procedural access side workup um, because you know there are diff diff uh, different uh, modalities how you can evaluate um, the access side. It's a conventional angiography. Um, what you can do, um, it has some pros and some cons. Uh, you can do microneedle injection. You can contra do contralateral injection. I think uh, there are different um, options you can use. You can use a CT scan in, uh, in advance, of course, um, and have a look at the bifurcation at the degree of calcification at your puncture site, something like that. And you can do vascular ultrasound, which is becoming more and more popular. Um, to evaluate the optimal and sweet spot um, for your um, impeller access. Coming to anticoagulation, uh, we have to uh, shorten this, um, unfortunately, a little bit because it's quite complex. Um, we, of course, have a standard algorithm for unfractionated heparin and monitoring during um, the impeller procedure. Um, so it's nothing special about that. We want to have an ACT above uh, 250. I think that's consensus. Um, we also know that we want to control the ACT during the procedures every 30 minutes, which is very important to prevent thrombus formation, not only for the impeller, of course, more, uh, uh, more concerning the um, uh, procedure. But I think in the consensus document, and this is something which is really interesting, I think, um, we also address the specific problems in anticoagulation, so heparin-induced thrombocytopenia over and under, under anticoagulation, and which is, which is really interesting is the bicarbonate-based uh, PERCH solution. You may heard, maybe heard that this was approved last week, um, so you can use that instead of a, a heparin-based uh, PERCH solution, um, which makes anticoagulation in some um, aspects a little bit easier. Um, and this is, I think, extremely important important to prevent bleeding complication, but also to um, prevent under, under anticoagulation during the procedure, but also in the post-procedure phase um, where patients maybe um, need um, anticoagulation. 
So the most important procedure or the most important step in this whole process is of course the revascularization. You are doing this all because you want to um, perform a perfect revascularization, an optimal result. And uh, the discussion about that, I think we have a, a talk from Vas at the end, going about revascularization is still extremely complex because there are a lot of scores you can evaluate on how is your revascularization success. You all know the residual syntax score. There are other scores like the Jeopardy score which has been um, also evaluated especially in the situation of complex, um, uh, complex uh, coronary intervention. So. Um, you need to come up with one uh, of your scores which are satisfied and then plan the um, revascularization. What we think is that it's very important to have a low residual syntax score, low score after the procedure to do extensive revascularization because from the studies we know that um, a better revascularization success also goes along with um, uh, with reduced uh, MACE rates. So what we think is uh, optimal revascularization is that um, the MCS first of all supports you a higher quality of revascularization. This is important. You don't need to ha take any shortcuts. Um, you can do the procedure as you want without having fear for hemodynamic uh, depression and problems. Um, what we see from non-randomized data is that complete revascularization um, is something you need to um, uh, attempt and uh, with that you can improve left ventricular ejection fraction and have lower MACE rates. Um, so uh, of course, and this is quite clear, we need more data on that, um, but it's on the way and with the PROTECT4 study I think we will get more information. But at the end, please remember this is the most important step, this is the focus of your whole procedure, all before and all afterwards is something nice to have and it has to be uh, without any problems, without any complications, so it's important to have a good workup pre-revascularization and post-revascularization, uh, but this is the main focus and here we need to attempt complete revascularization. So coming to handling in the cath lab, which is more or less um, something about monitoring and weaning. I think weaning is a very important aspect in this uh, topic. Um, we need to work on that um, because still we have uh, some problems with weaning, but in the pa within the paper we uh, discussed um, the typical characteristics where we can, um, how we can uh, detect left ventricular failure or right ventricular failure, especially in the weaning process. And what we all learned over the, t over the years is that a prolonged support by impeller also after um, protected PCI cases may be beneficial. Again, we need to um, uh, generate a little bit more data on that. But what we see from the current studies is um, that it's not a failure um, to prolong um, the unloading of the left ventricle after a protected PCI um, uh, procedures. And also in this aspect, um, excess site closure is something very, um, very important um, because excess site closure is associated with most of the complications we have. Um, and I think uh, what, what is standard now is that you use a pre-closure device and do a close monitoring angiographically mostly um, after removing of um, the sheath. Something very important, of course, also the complication and bailout management. Um, I think this is more or less about vascular excess site complications starting from dissection, uh, thrombosis, embolization and um, what we all do and this, this is I think uh, standard now is what you can see on the very right. Um, procedures, how you can handle your complication at the excess site directly in the cath lab by going, for example, contralateral or um, uh, from a radial access with um, extra long balloons to dilate um, the bleeding site, for example, or place stents, uh, whatever. I think that's, um, and that's the European consensus uh, for of the experts. You need to get uh, rid of your, cover, handle your complication by yourself because you need to be fast in this process. Um, otherwise, you get uh, severe bleeding complication and this is something you definitely need to um, avoid. So this was in 
10 minutes a very complex overview about the uh, best practice, European best practice ideas, what we uh, have in terms of pre patient selection, pre procedural workup, anticoagulation, revascularization, and handling in the cath lab. Um, and I'm happy to discuss that with you um, in further detail. Thank you very much also for all the authors um, who contributed uh, to this uh, project. We have seven papers um, on that and all these experts have contributed um, very nicely to these papers. Thank you very much. Yeah, Nico, thanks for the um, great talk and great overview, obviously. Uh, if you have any questions from the audience, please utilize the slider tool so we'll fill in all your questions due to time. I think just one question uh, might come up to mind. When you have problems in weaning, isn't that probably the best patient that you have pre protected? Do you mean what I mean? Uh, so, so if it's very easy and you can get rid of the pump like it immediately, that might also be a selection criteria, but we need data for that. But uh, So what's your personal strategy? How long do you and your institution normally leave the impella in after the PCI? So what's your normal strategy? So what we do after the procedure is that we uh, quite slowly decrease the, uh, um, the unloading. So we go stepwise down with the, with the um, amount of unloading. And uh, we very closely monitor um, things like LVDP, for example, um, blood pressure. These are the two main, um, main parameters we monitor. And if we see that the LVDP remains uh, stable, uh, the patient uh, hemodynamics remains stable, um, in some situation you may also have a right uh, heart catheter in the patient, so this depends. Uh, we strongly suggest uh, to do that during uh, these procedures. You can nicely monitor, of course, all other um, um, hemodynamic parameters. And uh, when you come up after maybe 10, 15 minutes, that's the normal time for us, uh, with a favorable hemodynamic dynamic, we take it out. If there's any doubt, uh, we go for another two hours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Nikos. Um, please keep additional questions that for the end of the session where we are going to have more time for discussion. And now we move uh, forward to um, the presentation by Dick uh, Besterman on timing of uh, active left ventricular unloading in patients on venous arterial ECMO. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction, and I think the room is packed because it's a very interesting times, so right? So many uh, RCTs coming to an end in the next like uh, ten months or so. ETLS shock is coming in uh, in Amsterdam, and then danger shock, even more important, probably at the ACC next year. So that's really an important time. I'd like to um, to to um, use the next couple of minutes <laughs> to to shock. Uh, and the unloading matter and VA ECMO treated patients. So we all know the SKY criteria, right? I think that's really important, very useful to do. And obviously we can treat with an appella, we can treat with an, uh, with an ECMO, and I want to show you some data and introduce you to one randomized clinical trial um, that might um, uh, show a benefit for the combination of the two very early on. So obviously when you have an um, ECMO, you increase afterload. And that's the least thing you want to do in heart failure patients, especially in acute heart failure patients. So if you have any idea about pharmacology, uh, pharmacological treatment, you reduce afterload in all kinds of heart failure. We do the exact opposite with VA ECMO treatment, obviously, due to the um, retrograde flow, creating a watershed, what you can see here nicely. And this can lead to catastrophic um, uh, complications like aortic thrombus, LV thrombus, and uh, volume overload, um, and the white lung syndrome. And that's quite frequent, especially white lung syndrome in, um, uh, in VA ECMO treatments. Obviously, thrombi, that's more seldom, but always, uh, or most always, a deadly complication. So what can you do? On the left side, you see the um, ECMO-treated patient, and you can add concomitantly an unloading device an LV um, unloading device with an impeller, and that's called ECPELLA or ECMELLA or whatever you want to do that. So you unload simultaneously to counteract afterload in, uh, increment uh, due to ZVA ECMO treatment. So you have two large borehole excesses. You need two devices, but this can work, and this, I think, 
um, shows quite interestingly the pathophysiology behind that. You see the LVEDP or the VEG pressure in this case. Nikos just uh, spoke about right heart CAS, and you see when you inc uh, Im implant the ECMO and, and utilize the VA ECMO in this first uh, yellow uh, part of the graph, you increase wedge pressure, obviously due to increased afterload. That will further reduce contractility and definitely hampers myocardial recovery. When you add an impeller device to that scenario, you reduce you reduce the LV size to normal in in a matter of seconds and can um, be at a very normal and healthy LVEDP in seconds. So is there data for that? There's a wealth of data for that. All is retrospective. That is the 2019 Jack paper meta analysis that shows all LV unloading devices seem to be beneficial for. Um, for um, for the patients, what we have done, we utilized a re or we created a retrospective database, mostly of European and some U.S. sites of roughly 700 patients. Did some propensity matching, and then compared mortality, just all-cause mortality in VA ECMO treated patients in the red line, and combined uh, or compared that to, to uh, patients treated with an impeller on top of the VA ECMO group. We call that ECMELA, and uh, you can also call that ECPELA, doesn't really matter, but it reduced mortality by uh, roughly 20%, so hazard ratio of 0 0.79. So that's strong data. There's a very important new data set coming from the ELSO registry. 12,000 patients treated with ECMO, roughly 25% were being unloaded, and the ones being unloaded by an impeller device had a decrement in mortality, so a benefit from that unloading device that was interestingly enough not seen with an IBP. So IBP might not be strong enough to have that beneficial effect, but no one knows in prospective data. And for that we created a randomized control trial that's now up and running. That will be uh, up to 14 centers, most in Germany, some European centers, and we call that the unload ECMO, div uh, uh, unload, uh, ECMO trial. You obviously see from the uh, study uh, logo what we want to do. We want to show prospectively randomized that in VA ECMO treated patients in cardiogenic shock, a randomized approach to add the impeller family, and I'll come to that later, uh, compared to control only, so no direct unloading by an impeller device, and compare that for 30-day mortality. So that's a very easy uh, trial from the hypothesis. So you have severe cardiogenic shock. You decide as the um, treating physician that the patient needs an ECMO, and then he is randomized to the intervention arm on the left side, impeller on top of via ECMO compared to the control arm via ECMO alone. We have a bailout opportunity in the control arm for an IBP, but no impeller. And on the left arm and the impeller arm, it includes the whole, let's say, impeller family, which I think is quite important, because what we do more and more, we start unloading the heart due during the via ECMO treatment with the CP, and then we upgrade the CP to a 555, to get rid of the VA ECMO as fast as possible. So on the left side, you have an impeller-based strategy, including the whole impeller family compared to the VA ECMO alone. There will be an insurance analysis, and then we will have um, probably around 300 patients. The uh, study is up and running. We just yesterday, uh, while I was here in Paris, which is very, very nice, uh, randomized the 10th patient um, with just one and a half centers running, so we are very happy, and I think that will be a good approach because we will not only focus on army cardiogenic shock, but also include acute heart failure, so non-army cardiogenic shock, because we showed in other papers that there's a beneficial effect of unloading in all patients with cardiogenic shock, uh, cardiogenic shock independent, whether it's army, CS, or non-army CS. I think that's an important part. Just one of the key features, and because uh, um, the talk was called Timing, we just pu published that recently, I think in December, that's coming from around a, da a database with 750 ECPELA patients. And what you see, when you want to go that way, and many are doing that, I think it's important to add the impella concomitantly, so as soon as possible. And if you see that the hazard ratio, when you wait too long, grows, becomes bigger, because if you have a thrombus, if you have LV distension, if you have a white lung phenomenon already, it's more difficult to address that 
then when you prevent it and add an impella on top of an via ECMO concomitantly. That's what we did in Hamburg and now what we are doing in, in Freiburg but crossing by a load. Conclusion, unloading seems to be beneficial, retrospective registry data, therefore we need a, 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 an RCT that's on the way and if you go that way, do that concomitantly. Don't leave uh, uh, the VA uh, patient without an appella device and wait for the catastrophe, for the LV distension and the thrombus added directly and we'll have um, RCT data I think in a couple of years. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much uh, Dirk. Uh, we have some questions from the, co the colleagues that are um, joining us uh, through the app so we can take them for you. Yeah, um, there's a question from the audience uh, comparing Impella to ERBP. Uh, maybe, uh, Dirk, you can say some words to that. Um, is the Impella comparable to IRBP or what are the difference and benefits? Yeah, that, that, that's a very good question. I think practical question. The IBP is a little bit smaller than the Impellas we have in Europe uh, in the moment. That will change in the future. I think the IPP might not be strong enough in view of afterload reduction to have that beneficial effect. There is data out showing that IBP might also help. I showed that Jack Review paper and the ELSO paper. I think that's quite a strong database. This was not associated to a reduction in mortality. And in Germany, we don't use IBPs anymore at all, so we don't have a console anymore. So it's, for me, very easy to choose that. I know that there are reimbursement uh, issues. We are in France right now. I think it's still difficult to get that here. I'm not sure about Spain, uh, what the situation is. But I think if you want to go the unloading way, the best data in the moment exists for an impeller-based approach. There's more than our papers that just showed that due to uh, timing issues. So I think, and if I can add one more second, uh, 10 more seconds, so in the beginning, you really leave the impeller on P2 or P3 because you don't need all the power of the impeller device. You just want to, let's say, drain or vent, to, to use a surgical term, the LV. And you'll see P2 is enough to reduce the LV size like in minutes. It really works fast. If you would put it to P8 or to P9, it, it would have uh, a lot of alarms. And there's um, a system that uh, utilizes the impeller console for a VA ECMO uh, auto mode that will come in, in the future, but that's not out yet. And then after that, in the couple of next hours, you increase <coughs> impeller flow, reduce VA ECMO flow, and I think one of the very good part, beneficial parts, is getting rid of the VA ECMO device as soon as possible. That's fantastic considerations, uh, Dirk. So let's uh, keep your questions. If you have any, we're going to have more discussion at the end. Let's now proceed with, uh, with Vas, Vas Panolis, who is going to tell us about the impact that it has on reverse compensation completeness, the use of mechanical circulatory support. And Vas, there are already questions coming up for you, so. <laughs> <laughs> some issue with the slides, if people can help us. Do, do you see your wrong, slides? I've got the wrong session here on the laptop. That's a five o'clock session. It's the, it's the wrong session. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting topic, this, because um, there's not much data out there regarding completeness of revascularization in high-risk PCI with mechanical support. So uh, let's have a little look. What I'm going to show you is some data that we tried to put together from uh, the PROTECT trials and also using a comparative group of, a, of the PROTECT 2 trial, the balloon pump, and see exactly what is the case. The main question is, do we believe that if we have a more powerful machine, can we get a better job in the corners? That is my conflicts of interest. We all know that a most complete uh, coronary revasc associates with lower clinical events. Recently, we had a very big complete trial in the STEMI population that showed much lower, significantly lower cardiovascular death and myocardial infarction, which is a very significant endpoint in those cases that had complete revasc. But obviously, also in stable ischemic disease, there have been a lot of studies from the syntax trial and then pooled analysis of the syntax, pre-combat, and BEST trials. Uh, arguing that the better your revascularization and the more extensive it is, the better your outcomes. 
Obviously, this is also reflected in uh, the current revascularization guidelines, both uh, in the States, uh, in Europe, and also in England, which is now not part of Europe, sadly. <laughs> um, but everyone basically is singing the same song, that, you know, try and do as good a job as you can, and you will get better results. We know that in this study, we thought we will compare the two commonly used devices, and obviously Germany has ditched the balloon pump. In England, we haven't done that, I think, not yet, not fully. We're not using it as much anymore, but uh, it's still cut somewhere in our, in our corridors. And obviously, you have also the impeller device here, the Percutaneo Selvad, that is a 14 French, and it has the capacity to draw up to four liters. Major um, trials in high-risk PCI, we have the PROTECT2, and we are hopefully getting now the PROTECT4 randomized trial, which is uh, well on the way. Regarding the balloon pump, uh, as you know, there were two studies. The BCS one that was in a kind of elective high-risk PCI population that didn't show any benefit of the balloon pump compared to inotropes in high-risk REVASC. And the CRISPR-MI, that was kind of a, I would call it a STEMI population, but pre-shock, and again, didn't show any benefit. I'm sure you all are aware and familiar with the PROTECT2 trial that showed nearly a 30% reduction in mace after 90 days in the balloon pump arm. Um, and it's very interesting, this slide, because you can see that the couple of my curves kind of keep spreading apart. And that kind of triggered the idea of saying, why is that happening? I mean, in the beginning, you see, you know, there's not much difference in the probably procedural outcomes, there was no difference in, you know, more deaths or anything like that. But what seems to happen is that probably with the impella, you, you can do a little bit of a better job in the corners. Uh, and that is essentially that was the objective of this trial that we put together, is to evaluate mechanism of the efficacy and safety of protective PCI uh, with uh, the impella compared to other uh, mechanical circulation support device, namely the balloon pump. So what we did is we pulled all of the data, individual patient data, uh, for Impella and balloon pump in high-risk PCI. We used the PROTECT2 data set, which is a multi-center trial from the 2007 and 10 era, the PROTECT3, which is, as you know, the post-FDA approval prospective registry, uh, more recent, and the RESTORE-EF, uh, the prospective, another prospective uh, registry. We had syntax score, syntax one score at baseline, and with that, we used that to assess procedural complexity. And we also had, uh, in a large portion of patients, post-PCI residual syntax scores, uh, which we used to assess the completeness of the revascularization. And this is how we did it. I know there's different definitions. You will find different studies with different cutoffs, but this is a kind of universally accepted one where if you have a residual syntax score between zero and under two, you have complete revasc. Anything between two and eight is incomplete but adequate. And anything above eight is normally incomplete. And this is the group that normally associates with worse future outcomes in the majority of the trials. Um, so we used, statistically wise, we did a lot of sensitivity analysis, so we tried to combine the studies. We used chi-square test, t-test, and stepwise regression analysis to find the independent predictors of the residual syntax score. Um, obviously, there was data attrition and missingness, but they were, um, we proved that that missingness was completely at random, and we used cases that had complete data sets. So as you can see here, uh, you see the list of the available baseline characteristics. PROTECT2 had uh, contributed 448 patients, PROTECT3 1,200 roughly, and RESTORE EF 400. You can see there the mean age are varying around 67 and 70, predominantly male, and you can see the newer association class. Ejection fractions in the class of uh, up from 25 to 35%, and you can see the syntax score edging towards the late 20s, suggestive that this is a population that has quite complex coronary disease. Here again, you see the, the pool data. So in the Impella pool population, that was a 1,800 patients. They were a bit older. In fact, they were about four years older. 
and as you can see they, uh, they had slightly better ejection fraction because in the PROTECT3 there were slightly better um, ejection fractions in the patients included but you can see that the complexity of the disease is similar between the impeller group and the balloon pump group. And if you just take the PROTECT2 trial and you compare the baseline syntax and the residual syntax, there was no significant difference, as you can see here. However, if you take and pull together PROTECT2 and RESTORE EF, you see a very dramatic uh, difference in the uh, residual syntax score. So in the PVAT protected PCI group, that's the impeller group, you can see that the baseline syntax score was edging around 30 and went down to 8.6 whereas in the balloon pump arm, it started from 29 and went down to 14.6. Um, you can see there on the other slide, on the right side, that with residual score more than 8, 63.2% were left like that in the balloon pump arm, compared to only 384 in the impeller arm. And that suggests that roughly twice more patients achieved complete revask in the impeller arm. If you pull together all the data from the PROTECT2, 3, and RESTORE EF, you see again this uh, dramatic uh, decrease in the syntax score in the impeller arm going from 28 to 7, um, which is 40% relative reduction compared to the balloon pump arm. And again, results remain the same with regards to the residual syntax score, more than 8, and you can see there that half of the patients that you see in the balloon pump uh, are left without uh, good complete revascularization. In the impeller arm, this is only the half of the balloon pump. And again, the sensitivity analysis, uh, you see again a similar pattern. Of course, there were missing data. These are very large registries and data sets, and completeness of revask was not mandated. And we are not really here to um, highlight and create uh, causative relationships but we're just offering you an observation, and this is a hypothesis generation study, and with a lot of limitations. There is differences in baseline characteristics. There is individual data pooling without adjustment for the study, study design differences. We have high levels of attrition in some parameters. The randomization is only for the PROTECT2, but not for the three, uh, PROTECT3 and RESTORE EF. We don't have any other additional balloon pump data other than the PROTECT2 patients because they just don't exist, even though practices of balloon pump haven't changed. And obviously, uh, there is the time bias because the PROTECT2 was done in the, in the 2007 era. So to conclude, um, in essence, we have seen that if you combine all these data sets, Approximately twice as many patients achieved complete revask with a percutaneous VAD, such as Impella, compared to the balloon pump, and you achieve about 40% higher revascularization levels with Impella compared to balloon pump. And this is something that we are hoping to be able to, to show in a randomized fashion in the ongoing PROTECT4 trial. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a fantastic uh, presentation. Um, I'm sure that we have some comments from the colleagues there. Yeah, there, there are some uh, colleagues, and, but you covered um, a couple of them already. Let's see if there's something new, not to your talk, but I have another question. Um, and I think the beauty of the data set you showed is the, 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 the time or the changes in treatment strategies over time in the impeller treated arms, right? Because when you just compare the three trials, so the in initial RCT and then the two registries, you see an increment, or I guess you see an increment in um, the completeness of REVASC. And that's something we learned over the last 10 to 15 years. And I think that's also very nice to show in that data set. So you can add another graph for the reviewers. Yeah, uh, no, to, absolutely. To show that, I huh? think it's important to highlight, you know, obviously in the PROTECT3 and RESTORE EF, you have the impeller CP predominantly, which is a more powerful machine. Um, and these are data sets that do not mandate completeness of REVAS, so it's nice to see that the operators just feel more comfortable to do a, a more complete job. I have also another question. I mean, completeness of revascularization is very important. Um, do you also can retrieve data on the quality of revascularization, which is also a very important point. So do you have uh, extensive lesion preparation beforehand because these are all calcified lesion like use of photoblator or any other uh, procedures? I think the quality is something and the extent in addition. 
I think definitely you can dig out data on use of declassification modalities and definitely there is a much higher trend in uh, Impella supported cases which also probably justifies in the original trial the slightly higher per procedural MI because it was a much higher use of rotablation if you remember even the PROTECT2 which is randomized now obviously it would be interesting to have data on you know IVOS use and uh, achieving the proper MSAs but uh, I'm not sure these will be available but we'll have a, we'll have a deep dive Probably you can leave a word to the PROTECT4 trial, uh, just explain to the audience what that is, what is done, what's the status about that trial? Yeah, I'm, or, or, yeah I'm very happy if you guys want to, to lay out the... I think that, I mean, th that's a very important trial running yeah. right now, it's US based, but there are many German, uh, European centers as well, and it's really filling the idea to go way beyond PROTECT2, making it a larger trial with concomitant data sets, and I think that will be very, very important. We are also part of that trial, just uh, included a couple of patients. And this is the challenge we see, uh, see today, to have complete revask in those patients treated with the devices. And that will be extremely important um, uh, data. I'm not sure how many patients are included yet. Anyone can just shout in. Do you know that from the uh, Biomed side? I think um, it's, it's, it's a large trial and, and they're good on the way. I the hear colleagues it's approaching from Dresden, halfway. Yeah. I think here it's yeah. approaching halfway yeah, now. 600, so. A little bit more than 600 patients yeah. already. So yes, that will be that, important. Remember that you have microphones here if you want to make your uh, questions. I have a comment, uh, a question for, for Nikos. I mean, or uh, would like to be interested linking his presentation with your presentation, Vas. These were, uh, this is randomized data, so the, the same operators were doing the cases with uh, intraortic balloon pump or with uh, Impella. Why do you think that these operators uh, perform a more extensive revascularization? Try to get in the shoes of these operators. Is it because they felt they felt more comfortable? Um, do you see any possibility of bias? Or do you think that suddenly the, the, what they found is that you know, they were much more stable and then they, they move forward in performing additional treatment? Are the same operators? Mm -hmm. <coughs> I think you nicely see that in the PROTECT2 uh, trial, randomized data, where you, uh, as Vas already stated, where you can see that, for example, lesion preparation was much more extensive. You can read that from indirect signs, like the use of rotablator was much higher than in the uh, IRBP group. Um, so the, the revascularization is something which is I think very important extent and quality and this can be achieved if you have very stable conditions like if the patient is unstable and with every balloon dilatation or with every rotor run or now with every shock wave we didn't have shock wave at that time but with every shock wave um, inflation you get a depression of the blood pressure um, the 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 the, um, um, the operators will take shortcuts to shorten the procedure and this means that the quality of the revascular may not be the same like if you have stable condition, right? So in, in a way what you are saying is that the operators were uh, sensible or sensitive to signals that, you know, patient could deteriorate if they move forward in revascularization. Please. Hi, nice presentation. I follow closely the field of mechanical circulatory support and I've been taking a look at the report from PROTECT3, which is actually the CVED study. Uh, uh, I would like to know why there is no report on 30 days endpoints, only in hospital and 90 days. And the second question goes to everybody. Uh, I've, I've seen uh, situations where the operator opts to leave the outlet of the impeller out of the heart because maybe it's too difficult to introduce or they are not able to do that. So do you think if you use impeller only in entirely placed in the ascending aorta, do you, are you still uh, producing mechanical circulatory support? The first question is uh, PROTECT2 obviously had initially a 30, th PROTECT2 had a 30 day outcome and then that was prolonged to 90 and you showed that graph and therefore PROTECT3 obviously voted for the 30, 90 day outcome. Vas, do you know whether there's a sub analysis looking for a 30 day outcome in PROTECT2? I, I, I'm not aware of 30 day, but I think, as you said, the whole it's point is that you see it, the, right? the impact of REVASC is just um, being more yeah. pronounced as the time goes by. And obviously, you have to think that this is a registry and people have to go down and fill in data. So, if you, if you minimize the data, you get more completeness okay. of the data. 
And in view of the, I'm not sure if any of you want to fill in for leaving the, the impella and the um, descending order or in the uh, whatever where not in the heart, I'm not sure whether that's a valid strategy to be. I, I'm not aware of any data I would, if, if I would put a large borehole X, uh, MCS in, I would use it and not put it in a waiting position. That's my point of it. I'm not sure. Do you have, have yeah. seen any data about no. that? No. No, no. One final question. Just a comment, Ali Al Medici from IBMed. Uh, the Protect3 uh, registry had an effective uh, endpoint going to 90 days and safety endpoints going to 30 days. That's me. That's me. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And uh, enrollment in Protect4, as of yesterday, we reached 590, uh, going to 1250 patients. Uh, where, where have you been? Sorry, I didn't get that. 590 patients going to 1250. Yeah, so half of it done. So that's a beautiful job. I think it's a really, really important study. And um, let's see uh, when that is finished. That'll be very, very important for all of us. So there we have uh, reached the, the end of the session. Would Which you is like good to wrap up? We, we have wrapped up already. I think with the uh, completeness of the uh, Protect4, that's an important study. Thanks for being here. I think a very interesting session. We discussed already and uh, um, enjoy Paris for the next the one and a half days.